be alive. Really welcome to iFocus Lecture 96. Today is the last of our neuro ophthalmology sessions, 25th, 21st session. And it's going to be exam special because it's going to be a revision of everything that you learned in the last 20 episodes in the form of OSCE and case revision. And we have a very bright young neuro ophthalmologist, Dr. Digvijay Singh. He also does tebismus, of course. And uh, he's from Api Center. He works in Delhi. And uh, he is very active in teaching and he is the president of Young Ophthalmologist Society of India. We have Digvijay for you. Digvijay, uh, you can. I'll stop sharing my screen. You can start. Thank you, sir. So I believe all of you, you know, you've had 20 episodes of Tiro Ophthalmology, so you should be able to do well in today's OSCE. And the way I've planned it is that we, I'm hoping all of you have a paper and a pen with you because we want to do it in, in, in a proper writing style. You have to be able to, uh, you know, write your responses here. That's the only way it will work well. So I hope my screen is visible. Yes. All right. Now, uh, we'll ask you 10 questions, all right? And each question, there will be two minutes. And each question is divided into three parts. So each part has got one mark each. So essentially, you'll be having a 30 mark OSCE. And I'm hoping that nobody scores less than 24. So at least it should be 80% plus. And then at the end of this, we'll discuss each of them one by one. And we'll take things further. The OSCEs are a mix of cases, some maybe some equipment, some clinical scenarios. And uh, so, you know, you'll need to apply yourself, but you also, I would want all of you, whoever is listening, whoever's in, to take a piece of paper and pen with you. So take 30 seconds to do that, keep it ready and write down the answers, right? As one A, two B, but still you write it down, you'll not, so sometimes we think we know the answer, or, you know, this is what it is, but till you pen it down, you don't really, that's the right way to do it for the exam. You don't really realize what you, what you were thinking, is that what you've been able to put down or not? So that's how we'll uh, go about this. And then at the end of this, we'll discuss each one of those scenarios. So I'm hoping all of you are ready by now. So we would uh, start with the first scenario. And this is a clinical case, as you can see. We've got a young lady, a 34-year-old lady who's an obese female. So there are hints in each one of these, you know, as we go along, who's presenting with transient vision loss, along with headache for some time, for about three months. And the picture of the fundus looks something like this the MRI of the brain was normal. So let's have you answering these. The first question is, name the possible diagnosis. And then name two risk factors for this condition. And the third one is that what are the surgical interventions that are possible? So just the names of the surgical interventions. So you need to look at this from the standpoint of that there are two fundus photographs there. Look at the optic nerves. What do they look like? You have a history of somebody who's a young female. He's obese. Headaches. Transient vision loss. Can sometimes go into a permanent vision loss if not treated. So Mark, write these as 1A, your answer, 1B, your answer, and 1C, your answer. One B, there may actually be many risk factors. So at least mention two, but if you know more, you can you can write more there for yourself. And then you we can you know look at cover those up as well. All right, another 10 seconds and then we move on. All right, let's move to the next OSCE now. Look at this equipment that's visible here on the screen on left-hand side. And this is what the report of this equipment looks like and answer these questions below. Name of the equipment shown here and try to write the full name if you can. That is what we are looking at. 
what form of fixation met monitoring is done when we are using this equipment to chart out what we have charted out here on the report what is the form of fixation and we'll also discuss the other forms of fixation that other equipments and machines use later on and the third question is that what are these lines that are drawn here you can see which are supposedly joining areas of equal sensitivity or equal thresholds equal sensitivity in the vision of the person so what is the term used for these so some of you may have had access to this some of you may not have seen this before or seen this in use before but it's important for you to know what this equipment is and what it does how it operates how it works and this is particularly of importance to neuro ophthalmology and we'll also come to understand that later again write your answers as 2a 2b and 2c each of these is one mark each so at the end when you'll be checking you'll be marking yourself you'll be seeing how many you've had and you can always post a comment right another 10 seconds <coughs> all right now let's move to the next oski here look at this one this is a young man 32 year old patient who is presented with headache a sudden headache followed by ocular dysmotility and ocular dysmotility you look at these nine gaze photographs here you need to look at the central photograph here where we are seeing a droopy eyelid or a ptosis you need to look at so the open eye is not been shown here but essentially there's an exotropia as you can see in the up gaze and the down gaze and the same was here you can see this eye is outwards not yet coming in so whenever you see a nine gaze you need to look at it step by step and then you answer these questions what is your diagnosis what is the possible etiology in this case and what investigation would you like to do it's very important that we need to do an investigation in this case what is the investigation that you would like to order the investigation of choice and sometimes things like this can be an emergency as well so once again there's a young patient the word headaches are important sudden headache and you need to know look at the eye movements also try and look at the pupils if you can write your complete diagnosis the possible etiology in this case and the investigation that you need to do or you would like to order there could be multiple etiologies but what seems to be the most likely etiology what is the first thing that you would think of when your presentation like this comes across to you So we'll have another 10 seconds. All right, let's move on to the next OSCE. Here, now here we've got an elderly person. So this is somebody who is a 60 year old male patient who has had a sudden painless decrease in vision in the right eye this is what the fundus photograph looks like what you're seeing here look at it carefully look at the optic disc what does it look like compare the two eyes and answer the questions first is name the most likely field defect that this person would be having in the right eye that is important name four systemic risk factors for this condition so you know there are some very common ones that we would always name but the reason we asked for four is for you to think a little harder is what the systemic risk factors for this would be and name the most urgent investigation that you would need when a case like this comes and you've examined this fundus and you you're thinking of a certain diagnosis what is the most important investigation that you need something which can come back very quickly and guide your treatment again you need to look at the age of the patient you need to look at his complaint and you need to look at the fundus photograph you need to look at the fundus findings the disc findings
the disc in the other eye, which is the apparently normal eye, also gives you a hint. Again, mention these as 4A, 4B, and 4C. Your answers. All right, let's move on to the next one now here. So this is, we are back to a young person again. This is a young female who's presented with a vision loss, which is a subacute vision loss in the left eye for the past three days. The right eye is okay. The right eye vision was all right and the fundus was normal. The left eye fundus is, is what you can see here. This is what it looks like. This investigation here is also a hint. You can see certain changes here on this investigation. What is the diagnosis? This should not be difficult at all. But if you can become specific on the diagnosis, that is better. Name the typical clinical features. So name two typical clinical features that will almost always be found when you see something like this in this condition. And what is the standard treatment to be given to such a cases in such a condition? What is the stand, standard treatment to be instituted here? So once again, these are classical case situations. You've got a young female, you've got one eye vision loss. You can see a disc finding there. You can see an investigation which has been done. And this is an investigation which is indicated here. On basis of that, you need to answer this. Even if the investigation was not here, you should still have been able to answer this just on the basis of the clinical presentation. Right. Let's move on to the next OSCE. Okay. Look at this fundus picture here. And with reference to this picture, answer the following. What is your diagnosis? And this is a good spot diagnosis that you should be able to have. What investigations would you like to order? So typically, what are the investigations would you like to order here? And we'll also come to investigations that you don't need to order when we discuss this. And what, name a differential diagnosis. What do you think could a differential diagnosis could be? While this is almost a classic picture, but there still is a differential diagnosis. So try and name that differential diagnosis. Again, I hope you're penning them down because writing is important. It's when you write that you actually realize you know, how to articulate your answers. You know, OSCEs are all about having the keywords in, the, in a short description, put down what the examiner is looking for. Look at the optic nerve here. Look at the macula. On to the next OSCE. Okay, take a look at these visual fields below. Right? You can see these are automated fields. So look at these visual fields below and describe the field loss. Describe the field effect that you see here. Look at both of them carefully. You need to see them together to be able to describe the field effect. 
and in neuro ophthalmology it's you know one should be able to localize the where the lesion is based on the field effect so the next question is a natural flow that where is the lesion where do you think the lesion is mention that and what is the investigation of choice so if you get a field like this a patient walks in and you get a field defect like this what is the investigation that you would do what is your investigation of choice which investigation would you like to water look at the fields carefully <clears throat> it's important to observe both the visual fields together with the eyes that's the only way you'll be able to make a proper diagnosis a description of the visual field is important remember there are two or three parts to describe three parts actually to describe the visual field and we'll come to that description when we discuss this case just have about three more to go All right, let's move to the eighth one. So here is a young patient, rather young patient, somebody in his 20s who is having a vision loss in both the eyes. It's a subacute vision loss. You can see the fundus photographs of both the eyes visible here. You can look at the optic nerves and you can look at what the field looks like for both the eyes here. Remember, this is a bilateral vision loss in a young patient, almost symmetrical, possibly. So name two possible differential diagnoses. Name two conditions that may present with something like this in a young patient. Describe the field effect. Describe this visual field. So description of fields is very important in the examination and even for yourself later on. And name two drugs or medicines which can cause this kind of a clinical pathology. There is a, there is a, there is a long list of medicines, but you should be able to name two drugs which can cause this kind of a pathology. And then one of them is a very common one that we use. And we do come across this in the clinics quite often. Again, you notice it's bilateral, it's both the eyes, it's both the fields, it's almost symmetrical in a young patient. It's not exactly symmetrical, but almost symmetrical. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, this is a little tricky, but you do have to have one of these which you know puts you apart from the rest. So look at this lesion over the optic nerve here. What is the lesion on the optic nerve? So what is this lesion that you see here? You can see both the optic nerves. One of them is normal, one of them is abnormal. In this patient, is this lesion benign or malignant? That is important to know. And we know some of some things which look like this can be dangerous. What treatment is done for this condition? So what treatment is indicated for this condition? What is the treatment that we do for this condition? You can see that one of the optic nerves is showing a lesion, which is different. It's not something that we see very commonly. You have to have some of these questions which would stand apart the gold medalists.
<clears throat> All right. After this, we come to our last OSCE. Look at the clinical picture shown below here. Look at this patient, look at both the eyes, look at the differences that you see in the eyelid position, in the pupils. What is the diagnosis here? What is your diagnosis? Name one test for the pupils to confirm the diagnosis and name two causes of this clinical presentation. So what are the two causes? What There are multiple causes, but name any two that can cause something like this to be visible. This requires a you know, astute clinical examination to be able to find this out. This is the last OSCE, so just note your answers and then we will start discussing them one by one from the beginning. And as we do that, you can correct your answers. Put tick marks, give yourself marks, which in each part is worth one mark each. So we're almost done with time. There. So I'm just going to spend 10 seconds on each question if somebody has missed any. This is the first one. Looking at the fundus photo in a young female. We had to name our possible diagnosis, name risk factors, and name surgical interventions. This was the second one. Looking at this equipment, you had to name what this equipment was. You had to name what is the system of fixation monitoring, and you have to name what these lines which are joining this uh, points of equal sensitivity are. And then you have to look at this, a, a young patient with a headache presenting with ocular dysmotility. What is your diagnosis? What is the possible cause? And what is the investigation of choice? The next one was here where we had an elderly patient with a acute Subacute acute vision loss in the right eye. Fundus photo looked like this. What is the possible field defect? Name for risk, systemic risk factors that are here, and what is the most important investigation that you want to do? A young female presenting with vision loss in one eye, other eye normal. What is the diagnosis in this case? What are the two typical clinical features? What is the standard treatment that we follow. This one, in looking at this picture, no other clinical details given, spot diagnosis, what is your diagnosis, what investigations would you like to order, and name one differential diagnosis. Looking at this field, name the field effect, where is the lesion located, and what investigation would you like to do? Looking at the next one, a young patient, both eye vision loss, fields which look like this, almost symmetrical, name two differential diagnosis, describe the field defect, and name two drugs that can cause this. The next is the photograph of the disc, it's showing a lesion in one eye. What is the lesion called, is it a benign or malignant lesion? What is the treatment? What treatment is indicated? And then the last one, where you find that there's a slight difference in the two eyes, name the diagnosis, name one test that you can use to confirm this. And name two causes of this condition. All right, so that puts an end to our OSCEs. Now let's start the discussion. I hope all of you have been able to answer them.
well participants on zoom have you been able to answer them okay good so let's now start with the discussion of each one of these oskis one by one we're about almost halfway down our program so this first one so we got a young 34 year old obese female who's presenting with a transient blurring of vision and headaches for the last 3 months mri is normal and this is an important reason here what is the diagnosis so here we already have some hints that we know it's a female who's a young female in her 30s presenting with transient obscuration of vision headache and a normal mri so this leads us to a situation or possibly or what it is an idiopathic intracranial hypertension or a bih a benign intracranial hypertension where there is an increased icp but there's no uh, mass lesion in the on the mri also known as a pseudo tumor cerebri so it could be any one of these so the possible diagnosis you can say ih bih pseudo tumor cerebri anything would be acceptable here name two risk factors so we already know that there is a risk factor here which is obesity that you are here but there are a lot of other risk factors for this to happen for example these risk factors can include obesity and let's say in a women particularly for this specific case if we say use of oral contraceptive pills hormonal imbalances use of uh, you know steroids steroid withdrawal use of isotretinoin high doses of vitamin a so a lot of these could possibly have been risk factors in a female patient like this other causes for ih could be hypercoagulability high homocysteine levels you know leading to a transverse venous sinus thrombosis for example but you know any one of these if you had mentioned you that's all right you know any two of these would have done the job and what are the surgical modalities so typically we would manage this medically but when the pap when the papilledema or the disc edema is very severe there is vision loss that's happening on the visual fields on the visual fields what would you observe you would typically observe an enlarged blind spot or you'll observe constriction of the visual fields so if any of that is happening and it is persisting it's not responding to medical management in the form of acetazolamide you need to think of surgical options if headaches are prime are predominant then you need to think of a shunt surgery where we do a vp or a ventricular peritoneal shunt or a lumbar peritoneal shunt where we are going to use a neurosurgically shunt the extra fluid out of the uh, cns out of the, the csf to be shunted out but if the vision loss is predominant headaches are not all that prominent then you can do this another surgical procedure called an optic nerve sheath fenestration so here the two answers should have been an optic nerve sheath fenestration or a, a vp shunt or a shunt surgery if you had mentioned alone that also would have done and these are both things that you must be aware of and these are conditions you will come across even later okay let's look at this what is this equipment i, I don't know how many of you actually have this with you at your institutions but this here is a goldman kinetic goldman. yes you you got that correct you have it there no sir no but this is a goldman kinetic perimeter did you know about it you've seen it before or just in pictures and the field here that we are seeing this is the field output of this it's manually drawn here and the fixation is maintained by a by a operator who's sitting on the other side so patient sits on this side of the machine with the chin here looking inside this big cupola or this drum also sometimes called the nicolet gansfield drum and on the other side you have the operator who's seeing through this this kind of a telescope here the eye of the patient so it's a manual fixation they're constantly evaluating where the patient is looking and from on top of this apparatus here there is a projection of different sized stimuli that are coming on this drum and as it comes along the patient presses and these are this is a kinetic perimeter so the stimulus is actually moving it's a constant stimulus moving from out to in or from in to out the operator can move it either way it's not a static where one blink comes and another light comes and another light comes here it's a constant kinetic visual field and so that is what so it's a, it's a, the fixation method here is a manual fixation under direct observation of the operator in automated fields the fixation targets could be different you could have a fixation which could be a blind spot fixation or it could be a fixation which is again based on the pupils so different forms of fixation are used 
and what are these what are these points of equal sensitivity which are joined here called these are called isopters, isopters. yes you're right these are isopters so this is again something that you must be aware of so this is it and this is specifically useful in neuro ophthalmology because you know we want to evaluate full fields very often small meningiomas here or there may cause an impact on the peripheral fields uh, we also want to be able to you know while in most of the conditions you are 13 dash 2 would be able to rule out or would be able to tell you if there is a field defect or not but full fields are important in neuro, neuro ophthalmology more so in patients who got very poor vision poor fixation central fixation loss central scotomas in their fields who cannot do an automated field very reliably this is easy to do quick to do patients with parkinsons patients with other problems this is a quicker field to do because the operator can actually based on the patient's response live real time make changes in how the field is being done all right so you must look at some videos on youtube on how goldman kinetic perimetry is done you must be aware of this device right okay let's move on so this is a 32 year old male patient so again it's important to know this is a young male patient who's presented with a sudden headache sometimes they'll describe this as the worst headache of their lives kind of a thing uh, and who's presented with ocular dysmotility when you look at the nine gaze pictures and how is it how should you look at any nine gaze picture let's look here in the in the central picture here uh, you have a ptosis that's visible in the right eye there is an exotropia that's hidden below because the eye is closed here i could not put another picture you're seeing that there is an exotropia here and you can see the exotropia here the right eye is not showing any adduction it's in complete abduction and it's in a slightly down position so it's a down and out position you can see it's not coming at all in the levo gazes it's right out there and the pupils are also slightly dilated so what is your diagnosis saloni Said uh, right, said um, uh, third cranial nerve palsy. Yes, it's a right complete oculomotor nerve palsy. All right. And what do you think is the possible etiology in this case? Uh, sir, the patient is uh, relatively young, so most probably, and uh, he's also presenting with headache. So most probably, uh, it would be some aneurysm or some surgical cause, and pupil is also involved. Yes. So in this case, it's probably an internal carotid artery aneurysm because the third nerve is going right there, uh, and surgical causes, of course, can be there. And pupillary involvement is an important thing to know because the pupil fibers are on the outsides of the third nerve. So if you're getting a compressive lesion from something, whether it's a tumor or it's an aneurysm, that would actually lead lead to pupil involvement here. And this is a complete third nerve, and it's a sudden onset with a headache. So an aneurysm is a high possibility. So what is your investigation of choice? uh am uh, am uh, i angio yes am uh, i angiography would be the investigation of choice here and i'll just try and see i did have a picture of his am i angiography here here can you guys see the internal carotid here dilated slightly dilated here as well so this was a small ic aneurysm that this patient had yes. and patient this is a medical emergency right you need to get this patient to a neuro interventionist very soon the third nerve is not really the problem here the problem is more that if the aneurysm bursts or something else happens to it it's a life threatening situation so that is very very important okay let's come here so what kind of field defect would you see in this situation uh sir uh, it could be a uh, altitudinal defect or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh there can also be a generalized uh, depression of the field or uh, sometimes even a uh, centrocecal scotoma right so typically typically as you said the right answer for this would have been an altitudinal defect so when you talk about and so this is a condition a case of an ischemic optic neuropathy you can see that there is a right disc which is there is an edema elevated slightly pallid here you can see a peripapillary hemorrhage the other eye is showing a small disc with a small cup this is a case and disc at risk is yeah yes sir that's an ocular risk factor here so we were asking systemic risk factors but if we had asked you an ocular risk factor what would you mention a small uh, sir a small uh, disc uh, there would be crowding yes a crowded disc small cup small disc now uh, the typical history that you would get here would actually be that the that the person has had a vision loss overnight that is what they typically describe 
and it's subacute. They realize it in the form of an altitudinal defect. They feel that half their vision has disappeared. The vision at presentation could be anything from even a six by six to a six by sixty finger counting. It could go as bad as that. And there are certain risk factors to, and there are certain group of people to which it will happen. The elderly, of course, most often. In the young, it's a rarer condition. What could you name some risk factors for this? Uh, uh, sir, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, nocturnal hypotension, uh, sleep apnea syndrome also. All right, that those are four risk factors. Nocturnal hypotension is also a very important risk factor. So we always do night BP monitoring sometimes. Then you can have hyperlipidemia, right? You can have high homocysteine levels. It has to be, of course, mostly an uncontrolled diabetes or an uncontrolled hypertension. Then you can have certain collagen vascular diseases. You can have cardiovascular diseases, coronary artery disease. So there are multiple risk factors. Any four out here would have been would have been okay. The reason we asked for four was so that you can scratch your heads a little more than just mentioning diabetes and blood pressure. That's an easy one to say for a lot of conditions. That's important. And what is the most important investigation? What is the investigation that you would immediately want to do? And to rule out what condition would you like to do that? Uh, we would like to rule out giant cell arthritis, sir. Right. And what is the investigation that you would uh, do then? Something which can give you a quick answer, quick response. What is typically done to look at a giant cell arthritis? How? What is the definitive investigation? So definitive is uh, we'll take a biopsy, temporal artery biopsy, uh, and there could be skip lesions. So, uh, like at least a two. But the first thing that you want, and that's a long process. So here, what you want to do is you know, MRI. You look at the blood, and in the blood, what is it that you want to look for? The ESR and CRP levels. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Inflammatory markers. Okay. Because ESR and CRP is going to be very high. And these are also prognostic markers, you know, as the disease goes along, as they come down, you know, the disease process is reduced. And those, these are answers you can get very quickly from your labs. And the reason for that is because in those conditions, almost, most definitely the other eye would get involved, you know, 90% involvement of the other eye within a few days, if you not take care of this problem. And how do we treat something like a giant cell arthritis? This is not a case of an AION, this is not a case of an arthritic AION, but if it were, the treatment would have been immediate. Uh, high dose of uh, methylprednisolone, sir. Yes, uh, yes. Followed by, uh, the, like, initial three days will give uh, IV, one gram per day, and uh, later on it will be followed by a tapering dose of oral steroids. Yes, so one gram per day actually is the dose for optic neuritis. Here you want to maybe give 1.5 grams, very high dose. Uh, to okay, sir. Patient. But of course, it depends on also the weight of the patient and the overall profile. But if it is an NAION, a non-arthritic AION, that is what we are probably seeing here, then what is your treatment? How would you manage it? What would you do? Of course, rule out the risk factors, but anything else that you feel, is there any definitive treatment? Uh, sir, oral steroids will give. Mm, okay, oral steroids actually, so oral steroids is not completely proven yet. The basic definitive treatment or would first be to manage the risk factors. Okay? Treat the cause. Okay. Yeah. The cause, manage the risk factors. You could decide to give some aspirin. You could give oral steroids in certain cases, but those are not definitively proved. There are anecdotal evidence. Uh, even studies have been, you know, going on about oral steroids. We still don't have a clear answer. So, in the ION, the risk factor management is very important. All right. So, good and disc at risk is what you mentioned. That's the right thing to mention there. Okay, let's look at this. A young female patient who's presented with a disc, which is, I hope all of you are marking your uh, answers if you've been able, if you've written down, so that we can know at the end, you know, you all have to cross the 80% mark, at least for this. It's not that tough and oski. So you have this young female who's presented with vision loss in one eye, the other eye is completely normal. What you're looking at here is the fundus photograph. The fundus photograph is showing blurred disc margin, slightly hyperemic discs, and if you look at the MRI, you're getting to see certain lesions, right? Very ventricular lesions, these white ones here, which are like Dobson's fingers. There are many other lesions that are described. This is a case of? Sir, multiple sclerosis, and we can see Dobson's finger in that MRI. Yes, yes. So, you, the, so the right diagnosis here would be optic neuritis, 
okay okay with multiple sclerosis or you and you can say in brackets papillitis all right so if you want to be very accurate because you're seeing a papillitis picture this is not a retrobulbar neuritis so that gives you an additional you know mark but of course even if you mention just optic neuritis ms optic neuritis or optic neuritis alone that also is acceptable in this condition it's not really a problem could you name typical clinical features of optic neuritis uh there will be decrease in visual acuity decrease in color vision specific in color vision anything uh, any kind of color red vision? green uh oh. yes what well, it so there is a red desaturation you know the red the red light gets lost most you know people say that the red colors are faded so there is a the red light sensitivity is lowest so there is a red green problem you're right it's a red green kind of color blindness but contrast sensitivity clinical features clinical features you know how would you examine let's start so the visual acuity yes you want to do this this i'm looking specifically for another keyword here that you know that that you know that if this is there if this is not there then it's unlikely to be this problem uh sir decrease in contrast sensitivity again that goes a little beyond something more clinical something rpd yes very important pupillary reactions so the classical clinical feature you must mention an rpd if you're not getting an rpd in a unilateral optic neuritis then it's not an optic neuritis all right you will end up with an rpd whether or not the vision is affected an rpd comes so classical two typical features if you want to mention you should mention you can say vision loss you can say rpd these will be accepted other than that you can mention things uh, again when you talk about clinical features typically you don't want to mention investigations like contrast sensitivity but you can say red desaturation is one clinical feature that can be there uh, disc swelling is another clinical feature that can be there you know retrobulbar pain can be there so you can mention any of these which are more classic for this kind of a situation all right and what is yes, the treatment sir. how do you treat this this is where the, the treatment you had mentioned uh, earlier sir o n t t trial 3 uh, days will give iv methylprednisolone 1 g and it will be followed by oral for uh, next 11 days and then it would be tapered correct absolutely absolutely so you this is this is the treatment that we want here that we want you should be able to write pulse steroid therapy if you can mention the details that is perfect and uh, you know typically you don't need to investigate all of them but an mri helps because it helps you tell the risk of developing a multiple sclerosis all right and there are certain factors that you look at the optic nerve which make it protective for multiple sclerosis for example if there's a lot of exudates if there's a no pl type of a vision uh, these are situations where you this is less likely to be associated with multiple sclerosis okay more of an atypical optic nerve all right let's look at this okay this is a spot diagnosis what is this sir uh neuroretinitis sir this is a case of neuroretinitis all right you can see the discs the margins are blurred you can see the macula you can see a star yeah, yes, sir. and uh, what so what are the causative factors what do you investigations do you do for neuroretinitis oh sir causative factor could be uh, uh, cat scratch disease lines disease and uh, idiopathic sometimes so mm -hmm. so you you picked up three rare ones but yes what is more what is more common syphilis that's the syphilis to aspirin is very common <laughs> most of the time most of the times you will have some viral infections or maybe enteric fever typhoid syphilis lines all these can be there so you're not wrong if you mention any of these that's fine you get your marks but uh, it's important to mention so here the investigation that you want to do are actually blood investigations which is including a tlc esr to look for in infections all right you don't want to image your, your first investigation doesn't have to be an mri when you look at something like this all right and that's important to note and what would what, could you name some differential diagnosis anything else which can appear similar uh sir uh, hypertensive retinopathy or uh, like later stages mm. yes so i would say accelerated hypertension or so you can say malignant hypertension so retinopathy in malignant hypertension yes you can end up with something which is looking like this sometimes ischemic neuropathy is may rarely end up looking like this uh but basically hypertensive is what comes closest and there you tend to see more of a macular fan rather than a macular star picture okay and macular star appears because of neuroretinitis right so the retinitis component of neuroretinitis 
So this is again a classic picture. Very often asked in OSCEs, you should not get this wrong. Okay, this is another important one, and this also brings us to certain other field effects that you should be aware of. When you look at both these fields, what what answer have you written for this? What have you described as the field effect? Sir, uh, congruous homonymous hemianopia. Which side, right or left? Left. Mm. No, no, right, right, right. Okay, so it is. So the first thing that you need to look at is you can see that you know the blind spot should on the right has disappeared, right? So the right, left is still visible. So it's the right sided. Yes. Is it congruous? Let me show you the lesion also. Wait. Let me just come here. So this is what it is. Is it? It's not congruous. It's a right incongruous homonymous hemianopia, and the lesion is at the level of the optic tract. Optic tract. This phenoidal enlargement here. Now see. Let's go back to why this is a incongruous field defect. Can you see that the defect here, up here? is complete in this quadrant and incomplete in this quadrant is that visible my mouse ah uh, yes sir yes sir and at the bottom you can see that it is here there is no defect and there is a full defect here it's not exactly congruous right this goes into the category of incongruous so the first thing you must not get wrong is the is the is the side is it a right sided or a left sided defect so in any field defect in a description it is right all right Yes, sir. Congruous or incongruous. So here it is incongruous. Is it homonymous or heteronymous? Homonymous means both involving the same side. Heteronymous means involving opposite sides or different sides. A homonymous. Defect would be a heteronymous defect. A bi-temporal defect would be a heteronymous defect. Here it is a homonymous defect. One-sided. You can see it's incongruous, and it is right-sided. So it has to come from the left side visual tract somewhere. If it was a congruous defect, where would it lie? It would be lying more posterior, closer to the occipital, somewhere in the parietal or the temporal visual fibers, right? Radiations, optic radiations. If it is incongruous, it is lying more anteriorly, closer to the, you know, in front of the lateral genic root body. That is the visual pathway that we know. So incongruous means it's anterior, and here we it forms at the optic tract because. The fibers which are supplying the the right side field are actually getting crossed over and seen on the left side. All right, so you should be able to answer this question. So the full field would have been right incongruous homonymous hemianopia. So if supposing you got a field defect which was exactly congruous and which looked just in the bottom right quadrant, right inferior quadrant in both the Feels something like what is a pie in the floor? Where do you think the defect would have been? Parietal lobe, sir. It would have been in the parietal lobe, correct. And if it was a pie in the sky, it would be in the temporal. Ah, uh, temporal, temporal lobe. What is the typical field defect that is described in occipital lesions? If the occiput is involved. Uh, there would be uh, sparing of that uh, mac. Yes, so you will get a complete. Uh, so this field. this congruous uh, homonymous hemianopia with sparing of macula, macular okay. region. Okay. All right, let's move to the next one. Here we have a young male who is presenting with a vision loss in both the eyes. You see the optic discs. What do you observe in the optic discs? Describe the kind of disc findings here. so there is temporal pallor there is a temporal pallor yes in both the discs and what is the visual field finding so what are, so let's let's start look at the visual field first uh, how would you describe the visual field right from the beginning sir central scotoma so this is a central or a central sequel scotoma but you what you have to describe is that this is a 30 dash 2 visual field All right, which yes, is showing a loss of central sensitivity, and both the eyes. So it's a bilateral central scotoma. But you can also see that there is a also a generalized depression. Can you see that in both the fields? And then in the pattern standard deviation, you're getting a more depression in the central field. It's actually affecting the entire vision field. 
but a central scotoma is the right answer or a central sequel scotoma so name two differential diagnosis what do you think could be the causes here so toxic or uh, nutritional so you could have it as a toxic optic neuropathy you could have it as a nutritional deficiency optic neuropathy anything else that you can have ethambutal toxicity mm, that is true uh, mitochondrial disorder lhon <laughs> Optic neuropathy system presented with this. Anything else that can present with bilateral central scotomas? Any hand patient? Optic neuritis can be present. You can have bilateral optic neuritis as well, which may present with bilateral central scotomas. All right. Yes, sir. So. Uh, <clears throat> so we decide the field effect so name name two drugs in fact name let's say three four drugs let's name a few drugs that can cause this nicotine ethambutol alcohol okay methanol but let's say as a more as a as a prescription drug you can have amiodarone you can have linezolate right ethambutol is obviously the most common one so there are uh, there is a whole list of drugs that is available so you should be aware of them but at least you should be able to isoniazid itself can also cause you should be able to tell at least some of these all right as you are right uh, alcohol can cause it uh, heavy metals can cause it so there is a whole list all right let's move on now to the next one here what do you think this lesion is what what do we observe here oh uh, sir uh, is it uh, melanocytoma yes that is a good answer so what you can see the right eye optic disc is completely normal the left eye optic disc has a pigmented elevated lesion over the disc slightly extended extending to the peripapillary area this is an optic disc melanocytoma is this a benign condition or a malignant condition a uh, benign condition sir what is a possible differential diagnosis of this which is a dangerous differential diagnosis we always want to be sure it's not melanoma uh, melanoma would be malignant Yes, and choroidal melanoma, just a papillary choroidal melanoma. All right, that is something we always have to differentiate this from. And the way to differentiate it from that is that you know in that it will be a thicker lesion, more than one point five millimeters thick. You can do an OCT to see as well. That lesion will have an orangish hue to it. You may have some vitreous seeds. You may have some subretinal fluid. It's you know, and you may see growth in that over time. In this, you often will not see. It will more or less be static where it is. You won't see too much growth. does this cause any problem in visual vision uh, visual acuity what is your oh, best sir usually i think uh, it does not cause uh, like we just have to follow up the patients regularly and look for uh, any deterioration in the vision or change in the size or uh, pig pigmentation i think so typically not cause maybe in a fourth one fourth cases it may cause some arcuate defects on the fields it will cause enlargement of the so field defects are well known enlargement of the blind spot almost in 70 80% you will get you will get some arcuate defects but vision central vision is normally well maintained unless until you get some retinal fluid with that so it doesn't really cause anything it's most often it's an incidental finding that you pick up or you know as a neuro ophthalmologist we get referred to us see what to do about this and so what do we do what is the right treatment to do what is the right treatment for this sir i'm not sure about the treatment so you just want to observe you really don't want to do anything so just take fundus pictures call them six monthly down the line if you're not finding any signs of growth now in this particular patient who was sent to me there was some growth but they but she was also pregnant at that time so pregnancy or hormonal changes can cause it to grow or change in size as it can cause to any other pigmented lesion in the body but you want to be sure you want to observe it over time there's no need to do anything major like any new creation a lot of times eyes like this have been in new created in the past but now we have recognized this lesion as a benign lesion doesn't cause anything so we can just simply observe there's no specific treatment needed let's come to the last one this is a classic case again what is what is the what what are the findings that you see here uh, uh, sir there is a mild dosis in the right eye and uh... mm -hmm. enough to Myosis is there, sir. Right. So you can see that the right pupil is smaller than the left pupil. There is a there is an element of myosis here. It's I'm not sure how clear it is coming across there, but I think it's visible. There is a ptosis. There is an end of thalamus. You can see the eye appears to be a little inside, little smaller. There is a reverse ptosis. The lower lid is going up. 
So what is your diagnosis? Horner's syndrome. Right sided Horner's syndrome. Absolutely. And uh, what are the other? What is the other <clears throat> part of the Horner's syndrome? Any other signs, clinical symptoms that could be there, which are which are not visible on the photograph? Uh, there will be uh, loss of celiospinal uh, reflex and anhydrosis. You could have anhydrosis. You could have uh, you know or some known as a Herculean phenomena. You can have where there's the loss of flushing on that side of the face. Correct. So this is a uh, Horner's syndrome. Could you name a test that is done to confirm this? Oh, uh, sir, cocaine test. Uh, okay. Uh, so there are so there are two types of tests. You can say that either you can do darkroom test. what will happen in a dark room or you can do pharmacological test so let's let we'll discuss both of them what would happen in a dark room test when you take this patient to a dark room will the pupil dilate or not dilate will the anisocoria increase or decrease so if you take, not sure if you take this patient to a dark room the left pupil will dilate more than the right pupil so the anisocoria will actually become more prominent all right what is happening here is that the right dilator fibers are not working all right so this is an optico sympathetic problem the sympathetic uh, supply is not coming properly you know it comes let's if you recall the pathway it comes from the hypothalamus right goes to the ciliospinal tract ciliospinal nucleus of budge from there it goes upwards this is come cordially from the hypothalamus and from there it goes upwards along the subclavian Uh, you know, it goes into the thorax, uh, into the uh, cervical ganglion here, right? From the cervical ganglion, a post-ganglionic fiber goes along the internal carotid artery to the eye, and some fibers will go along the external carotid artery to the face, which are the pseudomotor or fibers for the sweating. And the ones which go to the eye then will go along the internal carotid through the cavernous sinus, then along with the uh, third nerve will reach the eye. So that is the whole pathway, right? So uh, basically. Uh, we one needs to know the pathway and so when this and they are basically going to there's going to be a paralysis of the dilator fibers of the pupil so it will be constricted the parasympathetic will carry on now a dark room test is a simple test to do you take them to a dark room the the normal pupil dilates more the abnormal pupil dilates less cocaine as you said is also a right answer very difficult to get by almost impossible i think but what would happen if you do a cocaine test how would you do a cocaine test so you use 10% cocaine what do you do then You put a drop in each eye, and, and sir, uh, the normal pupil will dilate, but the Horner's pupil will not dilate. Absolutely, absolutely. Is there are there any other pharmacological tests that you know of? Ten percent hydroxyamphetamine test. Yes. What is the purpose of that, and what is done in that? Sir, it causes a uh, uh, increase uh, uh, of uh, norepinephrine uh, in the nerve endings. I think. Yeah, so it stops see the uptake and the norepinephrine levels are higher. It increases the release, sorry, and this is going to differentiate the pre-ganglionic from the post-ganglionic, right? So basically, in the post-ganglionic, you will not see a change. In the pre-ganglionic, you will see a change. Uh, the pupils will dilate, and the other test that is there is known as the apraclonidine test, 0.5 percent, which is going to again lead to a reversal. But apraclonidine, the the honor pupil will dilate more because of the denervation cell for super sensitivity, and you get a reverse anisocoria, right, compared to the other eye. So these are three tests. You should know the names of it. But if you just mention the dark room test, that's also good enough. And what are the investigations? What are possible causes for this? What causes Horner's syndrome? Could you name a few causes? Ah, uh, sir. Ah, uh, uh, it could be because of central lesions, ah, uh, like ah uh, in the brain, or uh, also a panco pancos tumor uh, at the apex of the lung. Absolutely. So it could be uh, lesions along the whole pathway. Somewhere in the brain, you can have lesions in the hypothalamus. Let's say multiple sclerosis, demyelination, tumors. in that area syndromyelia trauma coming downwards along you can have issues with regard to let's say the subclavian artery uh, problems you can have infections you can again have tumors you can have a neuroblastoma along the spinal cord uh, surgical problem lesions pancos tumor as you said so just trace the pathway then as you're going up uh, towards the ia you know in the postganglionic you can again have uh, again you know demyelination in that area trauma in that area and children sometimes neck trauma can cause this you can have uh, dissection of the internal carotid arteries that can cause this you know so a lot of these causes are there you, there's a whole list but if you trace the pathway you can name any two it's a simple thing to do uh, here but you should be able to recognize this condition quite well 
now before i close one just want to share with you you can also get in an oski sometimes you can get a traumatic neuropathy where you'll end up with a they'll show a disc pallor in one of the eyes the other eye being normal and you'll get a picture like this and you'll need to know that there is a fracture in the optic canal or an optic canal spicule here you can even see there's a fracture in the medial wall and this is going into the ophthalmoid so you may sometimes get oski which looks like this you can get pituitary adenomas you should be able to look at an mri immediately and say oh this is a pituitary and what is a typical field defect that you will get in a pituitary case bitemporal hemianopia you'll get a bitemporal hemianopia absolutely so this is what it is now so how many marks have you got have you calculated all of you calculate your marks for a minute and dr ashwin sir if you are there you can add to the oskis no thank you sorry dikvijay i couldn't join uh, for most of uh, the program but i i was following it and it was very nice thank you so much for doing this and i would also like at this point in time before we conclude like to thank dr santosh and i hope uh, the the new neuro ophthalmology module that we put up together you enjoyed it because we had the clear distinction of having the topics which are critical for the exam critical for the clinical practice and we covered all of them and they are available on our uh, i focus youtube channel thank you digvijay right thank you sir and i hope all of you have uh, got more than 80% marks in this you should have after you had such an extensive mm -hmm. exhaustive uh, set of neuro ophthalmology lectures that dr ashwin has been so nicely put in together for all of you so everybody should have had more than 24 points if you had less than that you need to go back and re revise this okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you digvijay so nice of you so kind of you very nice okay thank you no, hope to have you back again for squint sure 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 thank you okay nice. thank you good night thank you sir yeah before i conclude we have glaucoma session starting from 5th of may and that will be very interesting there is a series of 40 plus lectures running over 20 weeks so please be there on wednesday good night good night everyone